Hello and welcome to Amaze Me on BBC Earth, the short programme that seeks to amaze you with the very latest scientific discoveries relating to the natural world. Well, I say the very latest, the latest, but also those that make you go, wow, wow, <laughs> those which are truly the most sparkling. So prepare to be amazed. Today we're on animal colour, mm. and there's certainly a broad spectrum of that, isn't there? We love the way that animals are so colourful. Oh, it's beautiful. You go out and you just see all of these amazing animals and the diversity of colours is absolutely beautiful. And there isn't a group that does it really any better than the birds, I'd argue, perhaps, because of yep. the variation you can see across the world. What if I told you that actually the greens and the blues, bar one species, there is one exception. Turico. Turico. Doesn't... Sub-Saharan African, yeah. troctivorous bird. Yeah. Quite splendid, actually. A whole it range of different bird. species. Some of them with magnificent punky quits. A bit like you. Shallows. In the younger days. Turico. Yeah, yeah, I modelled myself on a Turico yeah. throughout the 80s. I thought so. I thought so. Proved erroneous, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but what if I told you that the blues and the greens and every other species don't actually exist at all. There is no such thing as blues and greens. No pigment. No pigment, no direct pigment, because it's really costly to produce that pigment. So how do they do it? How do we see blue and green? Well, what happens as the young birds are developing their feathers, there are tiny bubbles of water that help push the feather out. And what happens is, is the water evaporates, leaving holes in the feather. Now, wavelengths travel down from the sun. They bounce off in these little holes. And depending on the type of wavelength, uh, determines whether it can reflect back or whether it is absorbed by the feather. And depending on that, depends on how we see colour. So sometimes we see the vivid greens and the blues, and it's all about how wavelengths interact and reflect. It doesn't actually exist, which is just incredible. So your swallows aren't blue, your kingfishers aren't no. blue, your macaws aren't blue. In fact, blue, another thing about blue, you know, the blue pigments, yeah. they do occur in the natural world, but a lot of them, curiously, are toxic. And that's one of the reasons why they're not that common. Yeah, because they'd be really costly, wouldn't they? Producing that kind yeah, of blue toxicity. Yeah. And if you do it with air bubbles, much yeah, it's cheaper. much better, isn't it? But have a look at this. There's a little clip to show you in detail here. But if I move it around, the way that it reflect, reflects the light here. So this you magpie can see feather. This is a magpie feather, exactly. And often when you see magpies and similar birds, you can really see the rainbow on their feathers, which is just beautiful as it interacts with the light. OK, so no Stunning. pigment. No, no pigment, pigment in there at all. But what no. if I were to tell you that there were animals that can also glow in the dark, that can take light, change it and re-emit it so they can glow in the dark. It's called biofluorescence. And normally it means absorbing short wavelengths of light and then re-emitting it as long wavelengths of light. And I saw this once in the UK. Did you? Yep, I did, on the Isle of Sheppey in Kent. I went out through cool. a brick wall and I shone a thing called a black light torch which produces UV light. And there on the wall, glistening in the dark were hundreds of little scorpions. Oh. Yes, European scorpions have naturalised at a couple of sites in the UK. It, they were so gorgeous. And here you can see them. They glow this green colour. The question is, why would a scorpion want to glow in the dark? Mm. Well, it might want to communicate with other scorpions if they could see reflected UV light. Or it could be something different. And recent research has shown that the scorpions may be using their whole body surface as a photon receptor, i.e. it can feel the light because it's connected to its central nervous system. Why would it want to have a photon receptor in the dark? Well, these animals like to spend their time undercover, hiding away, protecting themselves from predators. But if you're out in the dark and it's pitch black, how do you know if you're under something? Because it will be dark in the open and dark under something. Well, turns out that if your body is a photon receptor, you can tell when you're undercover. And that's maybe why the scorpions are doing that. That's interesting. That's really cool, isn't it? Yeah. I never imagined that before, but to have a body as a whole receptor yeah. is quite impressive. That's, that's kind of an eye, yeah. but it doesn't produce an image. It's more presumably a feeling. It's amazing. 
But anyway, listen, scorpions yeah. not the only animals that biofluoresce. Mammals do it too. And some time ago, scientists discovered that flying squirrels, yes, flying squirrels also biofluoresce. Here is a flying squirrel. I've got to say they don't actually fly. No, they kind of glide. They're gliding okay. squirrels, yeah. yeah. They've got this piece of skin, this flap of skin between their legs, which they extend. I've got a great flying squirrel story. You've got a great everything No, story. seriously. So we were filming flying squirrels <laughs> once in, in, in Canada, and we noticed that they were following scent trails. They would climb up a tree to exactly the same spot. Then they would jump off and glide down and land on another tree in exactly the same spot. And they were landing about one and a half metres from the ground. And I thought to myself, I've got an idea. So I snuck down, hid behind the tree, waited for the squirrel to come down and land on it and then scamper up the tree. And then before the next one could follow it, I went around to the front of the tree and stood there like this, absolutely dead still. And sure enough, oh. the flying squirrel jumped saw me must have gone oh no and then landed on my chest quickly scampered up on the top of my head and then ran up the tree oh what have got oh, a fright it's so good so good i've been landed on by a flying squirrel. that is quite cool that is quite a cool story i'm not sure i can top that one wow. i'm not sure i can top that one but i knew some scientists who probably can they certainly can yeah because they were looking for bio the mm. biofluorescence in flying squirrels in the chicago museum using dead specimens collected, yeah. some of them hundreds of years before. And they got their little torch out and they're shining it around. And of course the squirrels there are glowing in the dark. They glow pink actually, mm. the squirrels. Yeah, it's not always pink. green. It can be yeah. pink, it can be red, it can be orange, not always green. But then they had an accident. They opened the wrong drawer. They opened a drawer of animals which are monotremes. Monotremes meaning that they are a type of mammal that lays eggs. They lay eggs. If that's not cool enough, when they shone the torch on these monotremes, in this case, the duck-billed platypus, what they found is it that they glow UV too. But it's a really unusual animal, isn't it? The duck-billed platypus yeah. anyway. It is really spectacular. Look at that. Oh, it's beautiful. No, I've never seen one of those. I can't oh, I would talk. Love I, I don't to have see a duck-billed platypus story, other than the fact no. that I went looking for them and didn't find them. Oh, I would love to see them. Yeah, I would. Absolutely. I mean, they live in the rivers of Australia. And they've got incredibly sensitive bills because they've got full of electroreceptors. So they're sensing the electrical pulses in their prey in the substrate there. And what they're doing is kind of scanning over, like you do at airports almost if you get stopped by security. It's like yeah. one of those scanners. And it detects its prey and then it's able to get it. Yeah. But they're amazing animals. They lay eggs, which is where the word monotreme comes from which is all about kind of the, having a cloaca and opening to produce eggs. So if that's not cool enough, they shone the torch on and then they started to glow. Glow in the dark. Let's have a look. Yeah. Look, here they are, glowing. Look Both that. male and females glow. Both yeah. male and females glow. And there you can see the ventral and dorsal surfaces. So the ones at the bottom are the undersides of the platypus. And they're glowing blue and green Amazing. in the dark extraordinary totally amazing. but look take a look at this other clip here because here is a picture uh, of a platypus and this one's foraging when it's down underneath the water and what do you notice about its eyes mm. they're closed Very white, yeah. they're closed so here you've got a crepuscular that means it comes out in the evening or nocturnal comes out at night animal that forages under the water using electricity to find its food and not its eyes it's got them closed and they're not very good anyway mm. so if they're glowing in the dark i would postulate yeah. that they're probably not communicating between each other they're not advertising themselves by hey i'm glowing you know the males aren't going hey i'm, I'm glowing beautifully purple tonight baby it's not <laughs> one of those sorts of things what what is something i never thought i'd hear you say <laughs> going on here well Let's hear from the scientist, Paula Anich, who made this extraordinary discovery. So why is platypus fluorescence important? One of the main reasons is that it shows us that animal fluorescence is way more widespread than we previously thought. We've known that birds, for instance, use fluorescence. There have been recent discoveries that reptiles use fluorescence, that fish use fluorescence. The creation of fluorescence and the use of fluorescence for communication, the use of fluorescence for camouflage, this seems to be really widespread among animals. And I think, I think that means that we need to research this more and we need to try to get a, an understanding of what the significance of this trait is. And I can't wait to see what we can discover as we look into this more. This research has led to um, a lot of interest all over in 
biofluorescence in mammals in general. And it's been so exciting to see um, zookeepers and biologists and museum researchers try to find other species that are biofluorescent. Um, and I think in the weeks to come, we're gonna learn a lot more about this as people all over um, try to see what they can learn about the mammals that they know best. What's next for my research team is trying to identify the exact compounds in the fur that are biofluorescent. We're also looking at um, other nocturnal mammals. And then another next step um, would be for researchers that work with the platypus specifically to demonstrate that this trait is really seen in the field and to try to figure out how platypuses are using this trait of fluorescence at night. What about that? Can you imagine Amazing. being there? Oh, in the museum it. with your yeah. torch? Oh. You almost can't believe your eyes when you see it, yeah. but there it is right yeah. in front of you. And the big question is, of course, why? Because we really yeah. don't know why. Well, I don't think they're communicating between one another. Not if they've got their eyes closed in the dark. I think it could be that they're reflecting UV light to confuse or to hide from predators. And they are, they do have predators. Yeah. Birds of prey will take platypus. Large fish will mm. take platypus as, they're quite as well. Small. Yeah, they're, they're, they're about not, 50 you know, centimetres yeah. long from, from bill tip to tail tip. They're, they're only, only about that long. So they do have those predators. And maybe it's a means of camouflaging themselves at night from those predators. Perhaps. Perhaps. It's always interesting, isn't it? Because we limit ourselves to the boundaries of our own senses. So as humans, we find it really hard to kind of visualise or think like a platypus because we're simply not a platypus and we don't know why. But perhaps there is some kind of sensory abilities or communication abilities or anything that we haven't found yet. And that's the most exciting thing for me is that this discovery leads on to so many more questions and some more, hopefully, some more interesting research and information. Exactly, yeah. exactly the right thing. And if you've heard of any discoveries yourself, of course, we'd really love to hear from them. But in the meantime, what about that? A duck-billed platypus, <laughs> an egg-laying mammal that uses electroreception at night to sense its prey underwater with its eye closed is also glowing in the dark. You couldn't make it up. You don't have to. Nature's done it for you. See you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.